Welcome everyone to the webinar series, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. This is the sixth webinar in the series, and uh, we're so pleased and honored to welcome our the two distinguished speakers uh, today, John Hay um, uh, from the University of South Pacific in the Cook Islands, and he is beaming in all the way from there. It's live uh, from uh, the Pacific Islands. And um, another island, uh, Nigel Arnell is coming from the UK, from uh, from uh, from the from the England, um, another island um, from the University of Reading, in um, as I said, in the UK. So this webinar series is based on a book that we all worked on together um, called "Our Warming Planet: Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation," and it's published by World Scientific. Um, publishing company. And it's a very special kind of book because not only are there written introductions, but it is really focused on lectures. Each of the authors created a lecture uh, on their, uh, ex their topic of expertise within climate impacts and adaptation. And so when you get the book, you get the lectures as well. Um, the editors of the, the book is um, it was was created and we all work together to honor the career of our colleague Martin Parry, who's um, at the uh, Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London, and was a leader, a co-chair of the IPCC Working Group Two on Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability um, uh, for the uh, fourth assessment and um, has been uh, active in the IPCC from the beginning. Um, he has a distinguished career leading our field, and that is why we all came together to create the book. Also want to highlight Manishka Demel, our co-host today of the webinar series, who is a co-editor of the book as well. So just to give a very brief overview of the book on the next slide, um, we have here are the topics and the authors. We won't go through all the uh, every, every uh, one on the list because we want to get to the lectures. But you can see that it covers the key topics that we need to really consider if we are doing a tour d'horizon across the field of impacts and adaptation. First, methods and approaches. Then impacts on sectors. This follows very similar in a similar way to IPCC reports. And most of the authors have worked on, on, IP on one and more of the IPCC reports. Um, impacts on sectors, impacts on regions and countries. And then uh, the final section of the book is on policy and practice. And um, in general, the webinar series is following this outline. It's not in complete lockstep. Nigel is going to be sharing with us from methods and approaches on assessing global impacts. John Hay is going to really be focusing um, on, um, on the, the very, very key and vulnerable place, places uh, in the Pacific Islands. Uh, so now turning to the agenda for today, um, Manishka is going to lead a getting to know the audience poll that's going to happen shortly. Then we'll turn to John Hay for his lecture um, on uh, the Pacific Islands, then a live Q&A session. So please, while you're listening, start putting in your questions into the chat. Um, then we'll turn to Nigel Arnell on the global scale impacts of climate change, regional and global. It's very nice to have a cross scale um, uh, lectures today. And Jen will leave the live Q&A session for that. And then David Rind and I, uh, David is the editor of the uh, co-editor of the whole series on lectures on climate change, of which this is one volume. And what we do is we invite any of the other authors from the book to join the panel. But of course, we'll be asking John and Nigel as well, where next for impacts and adaptation? Where is our field going? Where is the cutting edge work that we all need to do? 
as we are um, entering what is be really becoming known as the decade of action for climate change and a brief wrap up at the end. So with that, Manishka, I believe over to you for the poll. Great. To get to know the audience. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We have been doing these polls uh, to get to know the audience and uh, they've uh, we've really enjoyed because this is a opportunity for us to get to know all of you. So let me launch the poll and I'll keep it up for about 30 seconds. So you'll see a question popping up. Uh, so this is to get a sense of um, where all of you are joining us from. And not always, but often we have uh, representation from almost every region. Uh, at least once we had representation from all regions, but it is very late in, in Oceania, even though um, John is up and is, is joining us. Great. Okay, so we've got 80%, oh, 86% of the audience that have participated, so great. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So today we have participants from Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and North America. Then we, uh, let's uh, hear a little bit more about which sector you work in. So once again, we've had um, days where we've had um, all sectors represented as well. So even today we have a lot of sectors being, being represented. I'll leave this up for a few more seconds until uh, most of you participate. So we are almost at 80% participation. Just waiting for a few more to, to fill this up. And leave it up for a few more seconds to have a few more of you participate. Great, okay, so I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results. So we have almost all sectors uh, represented today, which is really fantastic. Great. Then we want to know a little bit more about your involvement in climate change work. So let me share this screen and put it up for another 30 seconds or so. Once again, we've, we've had a range of uh, people with a range of interest joining us. Great, we have more than 70%, okay, 78% of the audience has filled this up, so I'll keep it for a few more seconds. And great, so, okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So it's, it's really fantastic, I, we have people involved in so many different aspects of, of climate change, including those who plan to be more involved and those who want to educate people about climate change and related issues. So really great to have all of you, welcome. And in the chat, we would like you to um, also, if you'd like, uh, so you can share as little or as much information as you like, but we'd love to hear a little bit more um, about you individually. So you can share um, your name, country, institution, role, if you want to share your email with, with some of the participants, you can do that. And we'd also like to know how you think this book might help you. So um, you can please start that. Um, I've, I've also um, put that in the chat. So, you know, while we have the lectures, please, uh, please write your introductions. Thank you, everyone. And over to Cynthia. Let's turn now to our, our first lecture of the webinar today from John Hay. John, you have had over 50 years of experience in academia, private sector, governmental organizations, focusing on bringing an interdisciplinary approach to the environmental sciences and to technical work, policy relevant assessments and guidance especially in regard to tourism, Pacific Islands region, and climate variability and change. You, I, according to what we've found, you have three uh, affiliations, university affiliations, one at Auckland University in New Zealand, 
one at Griffith University in Australia and the University of South Pacific. So you are truly an island hopper. And um, you have been involved with the IPCC and um, as just as Nigel did um, uh, receive one of the IPCC scientists receiving the Nobel Prize in 2007 and um, a Guggenheim Fellowship, also very distinguished award in 1978. So with that, over to you for your lecture on On the Front Line, Climate Impacts and Change in the Pacific Islands. Good morning, everybody. Good morning from the South Pacific. And it's a proud and um, honored time for me to be a panelist on this lecture series and also to have contributed to the book in honor of Martin Parry. And I just want to spend a few minutes talking about my links with Martin, as Cynthia mentioned, Martin has been a co-chair of the working group two of, um, during the fourth assessment process. I first um, came to know Martin on a personal basis at the meeting in, on the Gold Coast in 2011 um, with reference to the special report of the IPCC on extremes. And at that meeting, Martin came up to me and said, that he had heard that I lived in the Cook Islands in the South Pacific. And he wanted me to know that he went to Rarotonga in the Cook Islands almost on an annual basis because he loved the diving and he loved the island life. And this was quite a surprise to me, but it was the start of a very, very strong and, and um, significant relationship in, in my life with Martin on both a personal basis um, during his visits, subsequent visits to, to Rarotonga, we became involved with him on, in his diving, um, socializing, and um, I even coerced him into giving a few lectures at the University of the South Pacific Cook Islands campus. And subsequent to that, um, my wife and I had the, the distinct pleasure of visiting Martin and his wife, Cynthia, um, at their farm in um, Beckle, Suffolk in England. And you can see a few photographs and you can also recognize from those photographs that we have developed by then quite a, a good relationship on a personal basis as well as on a professional basis. And one of the other links with Martin, uh, who's honored in this volume, is that he and I co-edited a special issue of weather and climate extremes. Well, that's enough of the, the background and my links to the person who the volume honors. I'd just like to um, talk about the title of my lecture, On the Front Line, um, and point out that there's two meanings of the word frontline, and I'm using the second meaning. The first meaning is a, has a military or conflict or struggle significance. And of course, we, as in that context, we think of, of the people in the Ukraine at this time who are distinctly on the front line in the military sense. But I want to talk about the second definition, which is in the context of on the front line representing being very advanced, um, responsible, taking a, a visible position in a field or an activity. And it's in that context that I'm talking about the South Pacific Islands. So the goal of my lecture is to talk about the Pacific Islands region in terms of being on the front line because they are undergoing early and very significant consequences of climate change. And then to show that the region is also on the front line in terms of adapting to these consequences of climate change including in terms of climate risk management um, more generally. So my lecture starts off with a 
brief introduction to the Pacific Islands region might not be too familiar to some of the people in our audience. I want to elaborate why the region is on the front line, and I will do that in terms of the climate risks the region faces, the observed and anticipated impacts, and this leadership aspect that I mentioned in the definition of front line, the leadership in climate risk management and adaptation. Then I want to spend a few minutes talking about the lessons learned from the long period of time that the Cook Islands has been dealing with climate change in a practical and significant way, looking at good practices that have been identified and particularly talk about the relevance of these lessons and good practices to other regions and countries, because we've, we've, the volume is an internationally targeted volume and the audience today, is, as Manishka has said, is from various regions around the world. So in terms of, of a introduction to, to the Pacific Islands, I, I think the best way to um, characterize that is, many of you will know that the Pacific Island countries compose a part of what we refer to as small island developing states. And that language has transitioned, transitioned to big ocean island states. So the emphasis now is more on the oceans that form a very significant part of, of these island countries rather than on the small land mass, which is a very constraining focus for considering the issues of these island countries. You can see there are 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. They manage over 30 million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone. And that's far greater than the largest economic zone, which is represented by France, which has a total area of of, and I'll say only 11 or 12 million um, square kilometers. The Pacific Island countries are on the front line of climate risk. And you can see there in, in this diagram, the wide range of climate risks that they are facing and some of the consequence of, of those. And I want to emphasize that when often when we talk about small island developing states or even big ocean developing states, there's a tendency to focus only on rising sea level and perhaps the ultimate demise of these island countries as sea levels rise. And I want to make the point from the outset that this is only one of many climate risks that these countries um, and small island states around the world face. And it's certainly not the most significant in terms of their futures over the coming decades and centuries. The impacts are equally diverse for these island states. And again, you can see that coastal erosion and beach loss is um, highlighted there, but there are many other impacts or consequences of climate change for these countries. And one has to point out that not all of these island countries are within a few meters of sea level as shown in this diagram, many of the islands are high volcanic islands and they have large land masses which aren't really impacted by rising sea levels and storm surges and so on. But of course, accessing these higher lands is exceedingly difficult. Most of the development is around the coast. So we cannot underestimate the significant of sea level rise and storm surges. So in terms of projections for the Pacific Islands, what, what, what futures do they face in terms of climate change? I want to emphasize the impact and the risk associated with more intense tropical cyclones. The number of cyclones may decrease the total number of cyclones may decrease into the future in the coming decades, but the number of intense 
tropical cyclones is projected to increase. And of course, one of the consequences of this will be increases in extreme rainfall. And something that I haven't highlighted here, but is really significant is that cyclones could expand towards the equator. Typically, we don't see cyclones or because of the physics, we don't see cyclones within about 10 um, degrees of the equator, but uh, in lower frequencies, even further out from there, but we see um, evidence of equatorward migration of cyclones in the future, but more significantly, a poleward migration of tropical cyclones in the future. Increased frequency of El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is a climate scale risk for Pacific Island countries and occurrence of severe or extreme El Nino, La Nina events has widespread repercussions in the region in terms of extreme rainfall, sea level, drought, and so on. And of course, that occurrence has repercussions around the world. Then, yes, indeed, sea levels are likely to rise, and that's something that has to be factored in in terms of climate risk. The projected increases in sea level, combined with phenomena like sea swells and um, storm surges, and also the El Nino Southern Oscillation effect on um, sea levels, is likely to increase severe flooding in low-lying coastal areas in atoll islands. Some other risks facing is because of the ocean warming, there'll be an increase in coral bleaching, and it, there by 2050, there's a projection that all coral reefs will be subject to coral bleaching. The pH, the acidity of the tropical Pacific is um, projected to increase, and this will lead to a decline in coral cal cal calcification rates. So the reefs are like, which are the food basket for most Pacific Island countries, the reef systems are likely to be hit a double whammy, we can say, in terms of coral bleaching and increasing acidity of the oceans. And finally, oxygen levels in the oceans will likely increase by more than 40% within the coming decades, and this has a huge impact on ocean ecosystems. I want to make the point that these changes and these risks and these consequences and impacts aren't just um, significant in terms of changing climate. They have a huge impact on development. And as Cynthia mentioned in her introduction, the Pacific Island region is highly vulnerable. It has the highest level of disaster risk of, of five global hotspots for disaster risk. And most of those disasters are weather and climate related. They have the very high impacts on their gross domestic product or GDP. Eight of the Pacific 20 uh, countries with the highest annual average disaster losses are in the Pacific Islands region. And the point here is that these weather and climate hazards, such as cyclones and high um, storm surges and the like, will negate the development gains that these Pacific Island countries have already made. And this is shown here, for example, since 1900, um, almost 8 million people in the Pacific out of a population of only 12 million people have been affected by weather and climate disaster risks. And a specific example um, of um, tropical cyclone impacting on Fiji in 2016, causing damage amounting to 31% of Fiji's gross domestic product. And you can see here the links in terms of climate change and development. If you look at the Millennium Development Goals, of course, we've moved on to now to the Sustainable Development Goals, but this 
analysis relates to the precursor of the Millennium Development Goals. You can see the seven goals mentioned there. And I'll just focus in on goal one, which is to er eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. And you can see this is a, a, a goal which is highly sensitive to climate change and disasters. And it's a goal that the Pacific Islands countries struggle to meet. Six of the Pacific Island countries failed to meet that Millennium Development Goal. But it also has a high potential for improved performance of um, that goal in terms of eradicating poverty and hunger. So there is opportunities through adaptation and disaster risk reduction to increase the likelihood that these countries can achieve goals related to poverty and hunger and other goals that you can see listed there, which are now, of course, reflected in the Millennium Development Goals, uh, in the Sustainable Development Goals. I want to move on to another aspect of being on the front line. This is a more positive aspect rather than the, the doom and gloom of climate um, and related risks. Pacific Island countries uh, as a region were one of the first two regional climate change activities funded by the Global Environment Facility. And in a uh, review, post-project uh, review of, of, of that initiative, I want to quote this because it sends a very strong message about these countries being on the front line in terms of, of their achievements in addressing climate change. For few projects better exhibit the spirit behind the creation of climate change and, and, and enabling activities than the one undertaken by the 10 Pacific Island nations aimed at fulfilling their obligations under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's a, a very strong accolade coming so early in, in our global efforts to address climate change. Another example of um, initiatives that the region have undertaken is that this region, the Pacific Islands region, pioneered a risk-based approach to adaptation. Before that, there was a focus on addressing impacts, and this often um, resulted in less than optimal responses in terms of addressing climate change um, risks. And you can see there that six case studies were developed to show why um, you make much more progress and, and have great effectiveness if you link the climate related risk management to the sustainable development process. And during that work, the term climate proofing was introduced as an shorthand to show that the efforts that you're taking are to reduce the risks of climate change to development. And I want to give one example from the country where I live. This is the, the main harbor for the whole country. It's the port of Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. And you can see there was a $22 million upgrade project funded by the Cook Islands government through a loan um, provided by the Asian Development Bank. This work was completed in April 2013, which shows you just how early these significant advances were being made. And there, the, that project and upgrade demonstrated both climate proofing and climate readiness. The, the harbour was climate proofed by replacing the existing wharf which with one which was half a metre higher and also the wharf structure was more resistant to wave forces which would be associated with these projected stronger tropical cyclones, or some of you know these as hurricanes or typhoons. We refer to them in this region as tropical cyclones. So strengthening the superstructure of the wharf system, but more significantly was to make the climate ready so that the height of that wharf superstructure was 
could be adjusted in the future. So the foundations were made more strong than you would have just for that increase in the height of the wharf by half a meter, but recognizing that the wharf might have to be heightened in the future as storm surges increased in height and therefore um, the added protection was necessary. The other um, initiative, the early initiative was um, completing the circumferential road in Kosrae in the Federated States of Micronesia. These, this uh, island lies west of Hawaii, just to put it on the map. It was only a seven kilometer section and the drainage culverts and, and road surface specifications were revised from earlier estimates because these earlier um, designs didn't accommodate projected increase in rainfall intensities and therefore for flooding and also raising the height of the road through the mangrove area to accommodate a predictive sea level rise. And finally, uh, larger culverts to facilitate the link between the mangrove systems on the seaward and landward sides of the road. We didn't want the road to be separating these important mangrove ecosystems. And a message that came out of a really early and significant message that came out of, of that work, which actually um, tried to correct the impression that climate change was always going to be a very significant cost, was you can see there the accumulated costs um, as a result of extreme weather and climate events in, in that um, island of Kosrae that would lead to road repairs and, and other interventions over the next 50 years. And those costs would rise quite rapidly because the road was under design in terms of its elevation, in terms of drainage, in terms of the robustness of the surface. But the climate proof design, you can see there though, even though, as you can see at the day or year zero, it had an initial cost which was slightly higher than the original plan costs of the road construction. Very quickly in 10 or 15 and certainly by 20 years, the accumulated costs of repairs and maintenance were going to lead to an overall reduction in cost compared, compared to the initial design. And this is a very, very important message, one that came early out of the Pacific and some other countries showing that if you take a long-term perspective of responding, responding to climate change, you're actually saving rather than incurring costs. And another global first for the Pacific Island region was to develop a regional policy for resilient development in the Pacific. And this linked, in a, and this is one area where it was a first, it linked responses, both adaptation and mitigation. So trying to reduce uh, climate uh, risks through reducing, um, increasing the ability to cope with those risks, but also trying to reduce climate risk right at the start by reducing the rate of greenhouse gas accumulation in the, in, in the atmosphere, but through disaster risk management and development at both policy and practice levels. And you can see there that this policy was endorsed by Pacific leaders, and I'll say way back in 2016, so there's another sort of frontline initiative. And the framing of resilient development that's in this policy and practice document is to look at both sustainable development and risk resilience increase. And so the increasing the resilience to these weather and climate extremes. And you can see there in the top right hand corner, the some examples of resilient development. And, but there are many opportunities for 
resilience to be compromised and of course many examples where development is exploitative rather than sustainable this um, policy and practice in the pacific is supported by a partnership which includes both governmental and non-governmental initiatives and organizations and um, is being very, very successful in terms of assisting um, Pacific Island countries to address climate risks. So what are the, some of the key lessons learned in terms of managing climate risks in the Pacific Island region? First of all, it's very, very important to identify climate and disaster risks early in the project cycle. An example of, of that completion of the road in Kosrai, the initial planning for that road didn't take into account climate and related risks, and therefore would have compromised the cost benefit of that road. Looking at um, the cost benefits, in terms of um, decision making as to how to manage those risks, strong governance and institutional mechanisms. So this is the enabling environment must be supportive of the practical work that needs to be undertaken. Build on existing mechanisms. Capacity is highly constrained in the Pacific Island region as in many other parts of the world. So rather than having separate mechanisms for addressing climate related risk, build on existing mechanisms, both at the institutional level, but also at the human resources level. Involve lo lo local non-governmental organizations. So this is framed as community-based adaptation, which is often done at the village level, at the, the town level, at the um, sector level, industry or agriculture and so on. Invest in knowledge and management and in information. This is utterly crucial. So often we forget what we've done in the past and we start all over again. And this is very counterproductive. And linking climate change and disaster risk finance to public financial management at the country level and also for developing countries in terms of the aid effectiveness of genders. Promoting gender and social inclusion because ultimately it's the people that are impacted by these climate events, weather and climate events, and they are the main source of solutions to these risks. And then monitoring and evaluation so that we can learn from what we've done in the past and have a process of uh, continual improvement. Good practice, just very quickly, was to engage with st other stakeholders beyond climate change and disaster risk management communities. Again, this isolationist approach to managing climate risk is very, very counterproductive. And we've learned a lot in recent decades that we have to take a much wider approach. Successful management requires both short and longer term perspectives. Yes, it might cost more to address climate risk initially, but the savings in the near and longer term more than compensate for these increased initial costs. Seamless projection, uh, progression from hazardous risk analysis to looking in, at and identifying your uh, risk reduction op uh, options. This is very, very important. And you looking at the identification of climate and related disaster risks early in the project cycle. This is so that you can be proactive in terms of your adaptation responses. And looking at doing an initial screening of risk reduction op options, because there are many options of how to manage these risks. And by identifying the most viable, one can increase the eff efficiency and effectiveness of the whole response process. And looking at sound social and economic analyses, um, as well as the robust science and 
um, using transparent and inclusive processes. So when we highlight the importance of cost benefit analysis, it's certainly not to the exclusion of other social um, analyses um, that should be undertaken. And that comes to this point that we need to take into account the cultural, aesthetic and related factors with, in addition to cost benefit analyses. And finally, uncertainty should be quantified. Decision makers not only need to know the risk, but they need to know the reliability with which those risks and the adaptation responses have been identified. So what are some of the relevance, what's some of the relevance to other regional countries, um, including to those of you who are watching this lecture today? Well, the Global Commission on Adaptation identified five investment themes that deliver high returns. I'm going to look at only three of these because they really do reinforce the message that I want to make that the work coming out of the Pacific has global relevance. The first one is with regard to early warning systems. And the experience in the Pacific is that these require partnerships with civil society and the private sector and must exhibit very high levels of social inclusion in order for early warning systems to be of great effectiveness. The second um, of the five investment themes was related to designing and constructing climate resilient infrastructure. And there the work that we did in the terms of the harbour and the road show this need for this seamless progression from hazard analysis to prioritising and implementing risk reduction options. And finally, something that's not relevant globally, but certainly to many parts of, of the world, was related to mangrove protection. If, if you don't protect these coastal ecosystems, then this increases and exacerbates the risk. And particularly when you're dealing with mangrove ecosystems, there's a need for planning and decision making to consider cultural, aesthetic and related factors and not be solely based on cost benefit analyses. So, a few concluding remarks to put this in a wider context. Um, the Pacific Island region has been estimated to um, experience or need um, adaptation assistance in nearly $500 million per year um, until 2050. This is a worst case scenario. You can see that it, these, these adaptation costs might be closer to 160 million by um, 2050. At the moment, only um, about 140 million uh, US dollars of adaptation finance is available to the Pacific. And so looking into the future, this sum is going to be inadequate unless it's increased um, markedly. But there's another dimension to this, is that this deficit in climate finance can be addressed by increasing the effectiveness and efficiency of adaptation and related initiatives. And the work that I've summarized in the preceding part of the lecture summarizes or and highlights some of the initiatives that can be done to increase our efficiency and effectiveness in responding to climate change. These learnings are relevant for the Pacific Island region, but they're also relevant for many other parts of the world. And so some of that deficit that we highlight there in, in the second bullet point, it can be addressed not by increasing adaptation finance, but simply by making our initiatives much more effective and much more efficient. So hopefully, might not be me 
giving it this lecture in 20 years from now, but hopefully 20 years from now, when we talk about the Pacific being in the front line, we won't be talking about the Pacific being in the front line in terms of climate risk, but only being in the front line in terms of the leadership and innovation and uh, other initiatives being taken by the region. So that ends my um, lecture. You can see there my email address. And if you want to get in touch with me to obtain more information or simply just to have a, a chat um, going forward, then I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing your vast experience in the real world uh, impacts and adaptation in such in the in such a vulnerable area, the most vulnerable in the world, as you point out. But also then um, uh, uh, really sharing how uh, how um, what what you and your what you and your colleagues in the region have learned by doing uh, can be relevant to the other regions. So over to you, Manishka, for moderating the live Q and A. Some is in the Q and A, and I think Joel just put one in the chat. Joel Great. Smith. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, really enjoyed your talk today. Uh, I will get to the Q&A and the question in the chat, but uh, before that, the, uh, I do have one question for you. Uh, it's, it's amazing to hear you, how long you've been working on climate change and related issues. Five decades is, is a long time, and you know, there aren't many people who have been involved in, uh, in climate change for that long. Uh, could you briefly tell us what your journey has been like and what it was like to work on climate change when it wasn't the hot topic it is today? Well, thank you for that, Manishka. It, it, um, it, it brings a smile and a frown to my face at the, the, the same time because I hate being remem reminded about the, 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 the long journey I've done and, and the shortness of the journey that's ahead. Um, but also it does bring a smile because it's, it's um, very important that we reflect on what we have learn from, from that journey and apply that. Um, unfortunately, I see many times people coming into the, the, the climate change arena, if I can use that word, and um, thinking they are the first ones to be doing anything about addressing climate change. And um, they have all the ideas and not bringing with them the vast experience in the past. And, and I, I want to say that in terms of, of a longer term personal perspective, uh, in the beginning, um, we were uh, very much in the minority. And in some ways, I think the climate scientists, if I can use that sort of generic term, were, were considered very, very fringe. And um, the at times, when you gave a public lecture, there was increasing an antagonism towards us because the message of, of, of concern that we were conveying um, wasn't uh, pleasant to the ears of, of many people. And so th they really did try and um, limit our opportunities to share our, our views. But as time went on, um, this transition from being fringe to being, and I'll, I'll be a bit of an exaggeration, but being mainstream um, is, is just tremendous and it's uplifting. And, and I'll, I'll have to say, it's the thing that keeps me going. I, I should have retired um, 15 years ago, if you think of sort of normal retirement age, but there's so much work today to, to be done and this um, and it's exciting work because now it's appreciated and now it's relevant. We're not, and, and I really want to end by making this point. When I started this work, we were always talking about the future. Now we are talking about today when we talk about climate risks. These are not future climate risks we're talking about. These are the climate risks that are with us today. And because we haven't addressed them 
in the recent past, we now face with an even bigger uphill battle to address them today, let alone spending time thinking about what these risks might be 20, 50, 100 years from now. We need to be focusing on addressing the risks of today, not tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, really interesting to hear, John. Thank you. Um, so next time we have one of our authors uh, from Japan, Nobuo Mimura, who uh, is also joining us uh, very late in the in the night for him, uh, similar to John. Um, I'll give him an opportunity to ask his question. He's joined here as a panelist. Please go ahead. Uh, Nobuo Mimura, I think uh, you have your hand raised. If you uh, would you do you have a question? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Manishka. Uh, thank you for hi, being John. Uh, it's hi, John. Uh, Nobuo. Great to see you. <laughs> it's a long time since I met you last time, and uh, thank you very much for a very uh, exciting lecture. And uh, you know, uh, uh, I've been working with you and uh, with uh, people from South Pacific uh, until uh, 20 years ago. But uh, recently, you know, I <coughs> couldn't visit uh, South Pacific uh, uh, for a long time. So when I when I work with the uh, South Pacific, I <coughs> I have a feeling, uh, you know, you say that the governance is very important to promote the uh, resilience building and the uh, risk management, and uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, governance, social governance, you know, uh, people uh, in the South Pacific is very friendly, and the social tie is very strong. So they have the potential to collaborate uh, 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 of the many stakeholders uh, in a workshop or community level. At the same time, you know the the efficiency of the governance is not so good, and uh, there is uh, many barriers uh, uh, among the uh, sectors in the government. Uh, the government. So, uh, I today I heard that the, uh, you made a big uh, progress in terms of the risk management and the resilience building against the uh, <clears throat> for the climate change. So. Uh, did you uh, have the? Uh, do you have the uh, some progress uh, to improve the uh, governance uh, in terms of the uh, uh, stakeholder collaboration and the uh, uh, efficiency of the uh, 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 government? It's my question. Thank, thank you, Novo, for for the question, and, and it's it's an excellent one. And uh, in responding, I can say that there has indeed been a great deal of, of progress. It's uh, summarized, I guess, in terms of community-based adaptation, um, where community groups, these are often framed around villages and uh, the strong governance that we have in, in, in villages in the Pacific using traditional systems, uh, they, we see now um, those um, villages taking more action uh, individually, um, but also taking more action supported by local government and national government. So there's been a bridging um, back to local government and uh, national government rather than villages and other communities that have taken these initiatives working in isolation. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that this has reached any level of perfection, but the trend is in the right direction. And the good thing is that there are now some um, very excellent examples of success in terms of these using traditional governance systems to drive responses to new problems that climate mm. change brings to, to communities and, and um, companies in the private sector as well. So we're seeing things moving in the right direction and mm. um, a long way to go. One of the exciting things for me is that I'm supervising a PhD student who is looking at a comparison between 
these governance systems for risk management in the Pacific Islands and contrast, mm. contrasting that with governance systems um, in New South Wales, Australia, and seeing what can be learned from the Pacific that has relevance in developed countries, but more equally importantly, what can be translated from developed countries to um, developing countries. So this is exciting doctoral work that I'm happy to be involved with. Thank you again for your question. Oh, thank you very much for excellent uh, <coughs> uh, responses. You know, we will continue to, to discuss uh, at the, uh, other opportunities. Thank you very much and a very nice meeting you. <laughs> I'm very glad. <laughs> Thank you, Nagwa. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take two more questions that we'll try to uh, address briefly. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Brewer from the audience. Um, Thomas says, you mentioned economic assistance from Asian Development Bank. Have there been other sources such as the World Bank and our individual national governments? Well, again, thank you um, to Thomas for, for that question. The, 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 the funding that I pointed out that comes into the region already comes from a variety of sources. In fact, um, if, if I was adroit enough, I would bring up a spaghetti diagram of the sources of funding for, for um, the Pacific Islands region. And if in fact anybody wants a, a copy of that diagram, please email me at that address that I gave earlier. But these, these um, sources are um, indeed from, from um, the World Bank as well as the Asian Development Bank, but they are from um, countries like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, France, and, and so on. Um, the European Union is a large um, contributor to funding um, climate risk responses in, in the Pacific Islands region. But we also have foundations, non-governmental in the um, support coming into the region. And, and we sh shouldn't underestimate the importance of, of uh, foundations and, and, and other non-governmental sources for, for climate risk response. And it's particularly important, coming back to the point that Novo is making, that this work is largely done at a local level. And there, the capacity, of course, is very, very constrained. And these local level operators um, often are not receiving the funding that's coming from governmental and intergovernmental sources. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joel, we have uh, your question noted. Uh, perhaps we can um, get to that uh, during the discussion at the end on what's next for adaptation, if you don't mind. And we can um, now move on to um, Cynthia, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Vanishka. And thank you again, John, for that wonderful uh, lecture and uh, question, Q&A session. 